In this module, we are going to do confidence intervals for the difference between two means, and we will do tests for the difference between two means. This chapter is very work intensive, so get ready to have pen and paper out to follow along with a lot of the examples that we will be doing. With this data right here, you'll notice there's a big difference between the generic and the brand name. These box plots alone show that the median has a very large difference. We can also see that the maximum here for the brand name has a duration in minutes around the median for the generic. So these box plots look very different. What we want to do here is compare the two means from the sample data. We want to make inferences about the population means. So we're not so much trying to figure out what's going on with the sample data. The sample data that we were looking at previously in the side-by-side -side box plots is insight into the population. Our true parameter of interest is the difference between mean one and mean two. For this over here, this would be the true difference between the brand name's mean and the generic's name mean. We are interested in the true difference between the means, and our best way of looking into this is to look at the sample difference between the means. If we had the true standard deviation, we could get the standard deviation for the difference between the means, and that would require the true standard deviation for sample one and the true standard deviation for sample two. In a lot of cases, we still don't have the true standard deviation. So we have to use the sample standard deviation. Using the sample standard deviation will change us from a standard deviation to a standard error. This is just the standard error of the differences between the means. And it would be calculated with the following formula. This formula is eerily similar to our s over square root of n formula that we've seen before, or our sigma over square root of n. If you square root both of these, you get basically the formula we're looking at with one sample. s over square root of n, well, it looks just like s squared is, square root that, you get s, square root n, you get n square root of n. Very, very similar to what we've done previously, but this time it's for two samples. We'll be using the t distribution to make comparisons here. Just like with a one sample t test, we'll be doing a two sample t test and a two sample t interval. I always say, sigma z s and t and if you notice when you have sigma up here you would use z when you have s down here you would use t so in a lot of cases you will not know the true standard deviation so you'll be using t the t distribution first before we do any of this we have to make sure that we meet our conditions to do these tests with that in mind first condition is always randomization we need to randomly collect the data from a random sample then we have the 10% condition. This would mean that we've sampled less than 10% of the respective populations. If there are 30,000 students at UT, you can't sample more than 3,000 or the error starts to compound with the finite calculations that we do. Next, we have the nearly normal condition. This is according to the central limit theorem that the distributions will look nearly normal when we look at the distribution of the sample means. Finally, we have the independent groups assumption. Now this leads to four total assumptions. The groups must be independent of each other. This means that the brand name and the generic items we were talking about before can't influence each other. Now a lot of times this is the case, but if you had something like people on a diet, their weight before and their weight after, and you compared 20 people, someone's before weight, before going on a diet, is going to influence their after weight. If you've ever seen the show The Biggest Loser, sometimes they have people who weigh four or 500 pounds and they, they lose a lot. Then sometimes they have someone who's maybe a little bit shorter and weighs two, 250. Well, they, they don't have as much weight to lose. The weight they end up being is heavily independent on the weight they were when they started. So in that case, when we're looking at a before and after, we'd actually call that a paired t-test, which we are not doing right here, which would require dependent means. Once again, we are looking for independent means where one mean would not influence the other. So to review, the conditions will be random, which means we need to randomly sample, condition number one, 10%, less than 10% sampled. Condition three, the distributions are nearly normal. And condition four, the groups are independent of each other. We can now create a T interval. Our T interval looks eerily similar to all the ones we've been creating. This time it's for a two sample, so you see here, we are trying to estimate the true difference. 
and our best guess of the true difference is the difference we observe in the sample. This sample difference right here is our best guess of the true difference, so it's the first part, the center of our interval. Next, for part two, we have a confidence level, which is a test statistic. It is the T test statistic with degrees of freedom equal to a more complex formula, but it has a certain degrees of freedom. The star, once again, means we get to pick it. We can make this whatever we want, but it's going to be related to a certain T. The standard error we've talked about previously and follows the following formula that we saw. To find the degrees of freedom, there is a complicated formula we use. You'll never solve it by hand, and you'd often be given the t-statistic on a test. So you wouldn't have to find a t-statistic. So let's hop over to the calculator right here and take a look at what would need to be done. So with the degrees of freedom calculator, you'd need to enter in your first sample size, and we could say 10 right here and your sample size for the second sample, right there, sample size one, sample size two, and these are just for group one and group two. Standard deviation of the first group, and we'll pretend it's three, and standard deviation of the second group. These are numbers I just made up to show how this works. Using this, it runs the formula. And now, the degrees of freedom for a two sample test are not n minus two. Oftentimes it is close to this, and you can maybe approximate it, but the formula is more complex for this. There are more calculations you have to do, and sometimes you will see when the standard deviations are the same, you will get an n minus two, the way the formula works out. But a lot of times in instances, you won't see the degrees of freedom as n minus two, and I'm saying for total n, where total n would be 20. It's not always a good estimate, but just realize there is a calculation going on here in the background, and it gets you the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom tell you which t you are using. In this instance, if I had um, in my first sample 10 samples with a standard deviation of 4, and in my second sample 10 samples with a standard deviation of 2, my degrees of freedom would be 13.23. And that means the t distribution I'm using is a t with 13.23 degrees of freedom. This tells me the t distribution I need to use. There's a lot we can do with jump. We can make side-by-side -side box plots, and we can also make our confidence intervals. At this point, a lot of the work you'll be doing can be done by hand, but can be done more quickly in jump. For the test, you will need to know how to do these things by hand. So look over the formulas, but you will be given them on the test. Here is the jump output. And we notice that we have the price offered for a camera when you try to sell it to a friend or a stranger. So just looking at the box plots alone, we can get an understanding of the data. There are a good many points in here, and there's a good many over here. Looking at the data, there are eight where you sold to a friend, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven where you sold to a stranger. Seven plus eight is 15 right there. So these points show us the min, Q1, median, Q3, and max. Same thing over here. And we can see that there is a big difference, but is this difference statistically significant? Well, for the first part of the output, we have the difference. This is the sample difference that was observed, 70.45. Now this difference is negative, meaning that friend was higher. Because think about this, stranger minus friend gives a negative value. So you can see where stranger might be at. Stranger might be about 220, and friend might be, let's say stranger is 230, just kind of, this is not the mean, but mean might be around here somewhere. Data is kind of normally shaped. If stranger had a mean of 230, and friend had a mean of almost, let's say, 300, that would give a difference of 70. Those aren't the actual means, but this difference right here, if we were to find the mean, let's say at 210, the friend mean would be about 280. This is the difference between the two means, and since it's negative, the friend had a higher value, because if we did 210 minus 280, we'd get negative 70. So with this in mind, we understand what this difference means. Now, the standard error is what is calculated to show us the difference in context. Let's take the difference of negative 70.45 and divide it by 18.71. And now what we see is that we obtain a value of negative 3.765, which if we had carried a few more decimals, it looks like jump does, we would have obtained this exact T ratio. This t-ratio is the difference in context, and we'll talk more on the test later. The degrees of freedom is what JUMP is calculating for us by doing the complex formula that we can do on the web page. It just took the samples, 
size and the standard deviations and found the T distribution, which is shown over here. This is a T with 7.6229 degrees of freedom. Now our confidence interval, which is the most important thing we're covering right now. This confidence interval is our best estimate of the true difference between the price offered between a stranger and a friend. We need to say, I am 95% confident that the true difference between price offered on a camera when you sell to a stranger versus a friend is that your friend will offer you 26.94 more or up to $113.96 more. I am 95% confident that the true difference between the price offered between a friend and a stranger is contained in the interval $26.94 to $113.96 with your friend offering more. Specifically, we need to add that last part because the friend is offering more because this value is bigger. And I know it says negative, but you can interpret the difference as positive or negative depending which way you say it. If you say less, meaning negative, you would have to say that you'd make less offering to a stranger. Specifically here, we can see the formulas and we were close in our guesstimates. We thought about 280 and 211 or 210 and 280 and that's true. This is the mean for stranger and this is the mean for friend and the mean for friend must be higher. Finally, we can see how the standard error is calculated down here, just taking the numbers for the standard deviation for the first sample, the sample size for the first sample, and doing the same thing over here. Standard deviation for the second sample, and the sample size for the second sample. Then we'll obtain the standard error. We can do these calculations by hand, but we need to find the proper T interval. Using these online calculators right here, we can plug in the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom will tell us the T distribution. If we want to make a 95% confidence roll, we have to shade in 95% of the middle area. These T values right here tell us how far out we have to shade, and in this instance, it's 2.326. And that's kind of close to our T interval of 2 that we saw with a Z, but not the same. Remember, the T is pressed down, which is going to make it go further out. So we see similar numbers, but not the same. Using these numbers, we can calculate it ourselves, and this is how you would do it on the test. You would have to obtain the difference between the two samples right here. Then you would need the T statistic, which is often given to you because you don't have the calculators to do it. This is the T for a 95% comps roll with 7 point, I believe it was 7.6229 degrees of freedom. And then we need the standard error, which we calculated before. All this computes to the exact same output that we saw in jump. Once again, interpreting this interval is so very important. The interpretation needs to be precise, and there's an easy way to do it right here. I am blank percent confident that the blank is contained in the interval blank to blank. The first part right here is how confident you are. Depending on what Z or T you pick, this is your level of confidence. The next part is what you're trying to estimate. In this instance, we're trying to estimate the true difference between the price a friend gives you and a stranger gives you. Put it in there, whatever you're trying to estimate, the true parameter. Finally, we need to name our interval blank to blank, and this would be the difference in dollars that we would obtain. And we can add the little addendum at the end for us where it's where your friend is giving you more. So this is your general interpretation. All confidence interval interpretation should follow this format. So let's do another example here where we're going to look at the amount of friends freshmen have on Facebook versus the amount of friends juniors have on Facebook. Here are our box plots, side by side box plots. Doesn't look like there's too big of a difference, but we can see a difference going on here, although we're just looking at the medians and we will go on to compare the means. Do we meet these conditions? Well, did we randomly select them? The problem would need to tell us we did and let's say we did. Are these people less than 10% of the whole population? Well, I think it's said in the problem that we have 14 freshmen and we have 16. And if the population were these numbers right here, then yes, we barely meet it. And if we're thinking about for all UT freshmen or something like that, oh, we definitely meet it. So we're good. The nearly normal condition. We would need to run a goodness of fit test or looking at the distributions themselves, uh, they don't really have any skew or anything, so they're not crazy. I mean, they're a little skewed. They're right skewed because some people have a lot more friends. Um, but nothing too crazy is going on here. 
So it seems like we passed the nearly normal condition. Seems pretty decent. We probably would want a goodness of fit test at this point to be certain, but we're looking pretty good. Now, do you think juniors and freshmen are going to influence how many friends each other has? This means that some way, somehow, the juniors are going to influence the amount of friends freshmen have on Facebook. And you might come up with some crazy scenario in your head. I mean, I can come up with some crazy thing. But it's not like we talked about the weight example before with The Biggest Loser where someone weighing 300 pounds is going to heavily influence how much they weigh after. Um, these are independent groups because juniors are not going to really influence how many friends freshmen have. So let's go ahead and look at this interval. Now jump is subtracting freshman from junior. So since the interval is positive, junior was bigger. You can see over here back on the data that junior might have a mean somewhere around, it's right skewed, so maybe 600, something like that. We'll pretend for a moment it's at 600. And then I think the difference was 150. So would you believe freshman had a mean somewhere in here? It's right skewed. So junior is up here. And it's a difference of about 150 if you go between. We can't see the means in the box plot. I want to say that again. So I can't actually see the means right there. But the difference between the two means is 150.45. Now the question is, is this a big difference? Well, the standard error is going to standardize this difference right here. So when we look at this, it's not that far away. And interestingly enough, what is in our interval? Zero is in our interval. With zero in our interval, I can say I'm 95% confident that the true difference between the average amount of friends that juniors have versus freshmen have is contained in the interval negative 84.7 to 385.6, with juniors having more friends on the upper side. And this right here means that the true difference could be zero. Or it could be that freshmen have 84.7 more friends, because if the difference is negative, the true difference between the means, freshmen would have more friends on average. So with this in mind, we're not certain if there is actually a difference because zero is a possibility. It could be that freshmen have more, could be that junior have more friends on average, but zero is a possibility. When you run the test over here, a lot of times you're testing to see if the true difference is zero or not zero. This two-sided alternative goes to the alternative that the true difference is not equal to zero. And we can't reject the null. The null would be that the difference is zero, which if the null is true, we should see zero. That's where I expect to land. We didn't land that far away. The p-value, the probability of our results or results more extreme, is decent. It's not great, but it's, it's good enough that we can't reject it. So I would continue to believe the null. More specifically, let's do the final summary here. This is a T with 22.3 degrees of freedom. This drawing right here is a T with 22.3 degrees of freedom. So once again, we have the interpretation right here, and we can see how it is subtracting the difference right here. So going under the assumption that the population is 141 freshmen and 160 juniors, we can look at the true mean for juniors and the true mean for freshmen. In this instance, the actual difference right here between the true means is 74.85. Now we can go back and look at our interval. 74.85 is in the interval, and this is positive 74.85. So it's closer to the center than you would think because it's not negative 74.85. 74.85 is in the interval, which we said we're 95% confident we gave our interval, and 74.85 was in there. Interestingly enough, there is a true difference. But this means we failed to reject the null, which we couldn't find a true difference. We said there, there is no difference. We, we failed to reject the null. So with this in mind right here, we'd actually make a type 2 error because we weren't able to detect a difference, a throwback to the previous chapters. We think about the null being there is no difference between the two means and the alternative being there is a difference. And this is a two-sided alternative right here for there is a difference. So let's talk specifically on the test. It's been in the output. I just couldn't help myself from mentioning it. It's such great stuff. Didn't want to go skimp on those slides. And I wanted to mention the tests. So here is the test we've been doing this whole time. We've been taking our observed difference. Remember, this is the observed and this is the expected. We observe a difference between the sample means and we expect this difference, which is almost always zero. And then we standardize that difference. And boom, what do you see? The standardized difference is what we've been doing this whole time. The same thing. So under the null hypothesis, we would have that there is no difference between the two means. 
under the alternative, we could state things like there is a difference, or one mean is greater than the other, or the difference is greater than zero. So let's look at the friend and camera example again and be very specific this time. Here's our data, and there's our box plots. Here's where the testing section is. Now we wanted to see, is there a difference? This does not give preference to either side. When we ask the question, is there a difference? Well, that difference could be less than or greater than. And you can't see it, just barely. But there's a little bit of light blue right there, just barely. And it looks like it's almost the line touching. But this is jump taking the area down here and duplicating it over here. Because the less than alternative right here is 0.3% of area. And if you double 0.3 and put it over here, what do you get? You get 0.6. Remember, the smallest alternative doubled is always the two-sided for symmetric tests. If you take the left and right alternative or the left and right tailed tests, you would get this way and this way, and you'd go both ways, and that's 100%. Down to the left is 0.3%, and over to the right all the way is 99.7. This is 100% because you would cover the whole curve. The greater than and less than alternative add up to 100%. But the p-value we are really concerned about here is the does not equals, because we want to ask, is there a difference? This difference we observe, observe of 70.45, is that a big enough difference to say there's a difference? And the answer is yes. This also relates to our confidence interval. In our confidence interval from the previous slide, we were saying we are 95% confident the true difference is contained in this interval. Well, this is saying your friend will offer you this much more money. Remember, friend is on this side, so if negative, if this number down here is negative, it's because friend would have to be bigger. Just put in your head, 100 minus 150 gives you negative. So the second number has to be bigger for all this down here to be negative for the difference or for our confidence intervals for the difference. So with this in mind, your friend will give you more money. That makes sense. My friends are usually nicer. So you should sell your camera to a friend. He's like, oh, sell it to a stranger and make more money. No, the evidence shows that you'll make more money selling it to a friend. Maybe you should give your friend a deal. That'd be nice. <laughs> So the confidence intervals and the test line up. Because when we reject on the test, we're saying that the difference isn't zero. We are saying, I reject zero as being the truth because my results landed far away. If, if zero is the truth, we should land right here. That's what the null states. We should land right here. But we landed far away. We landed all the way over here. We can also do this in Excel. Excel has the abilities to do this. So feel free to throw it into Excel and do it. Um, I know a lot of people love Excel, and Excel has come a long way from back in the day when we say, oh, Excel, it can't do anything. It can do pretty much anything now. Here's the output from Excel. We can see the one-tailed test and the two-tailed test, and it's supplying for you the smaller p-values. You'll notice it actually gives a few more decimals. Jump can do the same thing if you just hover over them. Here is our less than test right here to say that we have evidence that a stranger will give you less money. Here is evidence on a two-tailed test to say that there is evidence of a difference between the difference, true mean of what your friend will give you and a stranger will give you. So this company thinks it can make a change in the reading comprehension of third graders. They've got their strategy and then we have the traditional strategy. So there we go. We put third graders in one group and we put third graders in another group. So will the company's strategy improve? Well. Let's go through and first check our null and our alternative. Well, when we do the null and alternative right here, we would need to talk about the true difference between the means. This right here is our null. For the null, we would have that it is equal to zero, equal to zero right here. Now for the alternative, we would need that the new techniques are actually better than the control. Now here's the important part. Do we want to do greater than, less than, or not equal to? Well, if we want the new techniques to be better, imagine they're scoring a 90 with the new techniques and an 80 with the old techniques. That would, I mean, that's at least they're higher. We can't say if that's statistically significant, but that means that new techniques needs to be bigger, which means this difference right here needs to be greater than zero. The alternative is always what you want to show evidence of. New technique versus old techniques? Well, I don't know which is better. I would believe right now the difference to be zero, I want to show evidence that the new techniques are better. The alternative is always the evidence-based claim. So here's our box plots. Well, what do we see? The new techniques are doing better. Hey, it's proven. Well, 
we don't have enough yet. We don't have any evidence. We just have some dots on a box plot. Let's check our conditions. Did we randomly select these students? Did we put them into random groups? If we did, we're good. Are these students less than 10% of all students? Well, there's a lot of third graders. And I doubt we sampled more than 10% of all third graders out there. The nearly normal condition. Well, the data doesn't look extremely skewed. The box plots look fairly symmetric. So, and there's a lot of data points um, looking at this right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. There's roughly at least 20 data points or so. So the nearly normal condition seems to be met because this is going to be normal if it doesn't have extreme skew. This is the central limit theorem in practice again. Um, it would be great to have a goodness of fit test and then we could just say, oh, it passes the goodness of fit test, it's normal enough. But the central limit theorem seems to say we're all right right there. Are these bunch of third graders in the new technique gonna influence the old technique? I don't think so. Uh, we're gonna put them in separate rooms and we're gonna use one technique on one and the other technique on the other and see which one works best. So I don't think they're gonna influence each other. So let's go on right here and check. Here is our data. We have a difference of 9.9. .9. What do we need to do that difference? If you look right here, just dividing out is going to give you the T ratio. If you think of this as 9.5 and nine, well, that's almost two. These two numbers right here, a difference standardized is a test statistic. Done, well, that's, we figured it out. This formula, I wanna make this clear, this difference standardized, going back, if you look at the formula, the formula we are using is a difference between two means standardized. This is the first number I'm gonna hover over, and this is the second, so let's look back at it again. Literally, the formula right here is first number, second number, right there. Difference, standardized, T ratio. So this is a T with 37.27 degrees of freedom. Looks kind of like a normal, but that's actually a T curve right there. Our confidence interval says that I am 95% confident. Always look here to see if it's 95. Sometimes is, sometimes is not. I'm 95% confident that the true difference between the new technique and the old technique is on average we will see 0.81 points more with the new technique to 18.99 points more with the new technique because this difference is positive the new activities versus the control which was the old activities we see the new activities as higher so this difference right here means that the new activities are almost 10 points higher is this difference statistically significant yes for two reasons one, we asked if the new techniques were better. And do you see this greater than sign? Just plug it in right here. New activities greater than control activities. That's what we're trying to show. New activities greater than control activities. We are specifically wondering about this alternative hypothesis, and it is statistically significant, at an alpha of 0.05. Also, the difference is not zero. Now, this test right here, when using a confidence interval, relates to a two-sided. But if the two-sided was significant, one of the one-sided will be significant. The two-sided is always double the smallest one-sided. And we see that right here. This one, double it, and we get this. So since the two-sided is significant, one of the one-sided must be significant, and it's the one we're interested in. And our confidence interval does not contain zero, so we're saying well, we think there is a difference. And that would go with saying over here, reject the null, evidence of a difference. But once again, we want to show the new technique is better, so we want this one when we do our write-up. When we do our write-up, we want to show evidence of the new technique being better. So finally, we have all this right here. Use your direct interpretation. Make sure to be specific. Let's try this out. We have right here a difference and a standard error. So how could we get the T-ratio? We just take the difference and divide it by the standard error. Wow, great. What does this 8.9 mean? It means that this curve right here is a T curve with 8.9 degrees of freedom. What do we have over here? Well, we have a confidence interval. The confidence interval tells us we are 95% confident, always look there, that the true difference between generic and brand name is contained in the interval 2.08 to 35.11, with generic having a longer duration right there. You wouldn't think it, but hey, apparently the generic batteries have a longer duration. That's excellent. So we have evidence that the generic batteries are better. How do we have evidence? Well, if we wanted to show that the generic batteries are better, 
we could do a test where we want to show the mean of generic is greater than the mean of brand name. And we just take this greater than sign right here and plug it in. And look, we have evidence of this alternative. Also, zero is not contained in this interval. So we're saying there is a difference. And since these numbers are positive, generic had to be bigger. If the number here is positive, 18.6, well, the only way to obtain that is like 18.6 minus zero. That would give you 18.6. And I know these numbers aren't 18.6. I usually try to take a guess. Uh, if we pretend this is, let's just say this is 200, and then this would be 182. So 200 and then 182 is a difference of about 18. 200 minus 182. I'm just making up fake pretend numbers there. But you can see how this number over here being bigger minus a smaller number gives you a positive difference. And that's why these numbers are that way. Good luck.